All right, so let's turn our attention to the rear anti-sway bar. Now to answer any questions, yes, you need a sway bar on this. And since all the weight's in the back, you're gonna want to run a rear sway bar because how sway bar works is the rear affects the front, the front affects the rear. So uh, if you run a stiff rear sway arm, your front end will get more traction. If you run a stiff front, your rear end will get more traction. And we want to give this the feel of a front heavy car uh, so that we can drift and slide around and get more traction to those front wheels. Uh, number one, because of the rear live axle. Number two, uh, that's what lacks in a rear engine mounted car. So the sway bar I have here is off a Yamaha Grizzly 700 utility quad, which is big, it's heavy, so this bar is gonna be pretty stout and it's gonna serve our purpose nicely. Uh, I chose this one because the end links on it. These are the stock end links for a Polaris Outlaw. So um, I, I, I couldn't use the sway bar off of the Outlaw because it's integrated into the frame. It's not a bolt-on like this. Uh, the first one I did, I cut the frame up and I wasn't really happy about it because I wanted to uh, sell that frame, get some of my money back. So the second one, I did this little trick and it's worked out really nicely. So the rear end links just go right on here. These are threaded because they're replaceable. This sway bar is replaceable. These rubber bushings are replaceable. Everything on here is replaceable with common ATV parts. So once you get this on and level, we're gonna drill holes right through this tubing, but we're gonna weld in the bolts so it won't lose much strength. So then we'll get our cross members in place, weld some brackets onto there or some tabs onto there, cut these to the appropriate length so this is level, and then we'll uh, tap or die, whatever you wanna call it, uh, new threads onto this end link for the appropriate length and then we will have a functional sway bar. All right, so we got the holes done for that. Um, like I said, I drilled through here, and I know there's some physics experts out there, um, but if you look at the force being applied, it's not a pulling force or a twisting force. It's right in line with this rear uh, vertical piece. Um, inch and a half tubing is good for like 36,000 pounds per square inch, all right? We've got well over a thousand inches on here. So even if this degrades this, I don't know, 70%, 80%, it's still thousands of pounds of strength. Now I didn't have them on hand, but I wanted to get this done today, but I am gonna drill this out and put a weld bung in here. So then it's just screw it right in. Um, if there's any questions on that, uh, you, can, you can Google it. Um, I, I do a lot of math research on this stuff because safety is the number one priority. And I know you're not supposed to drill holes in tubing, but you have to look at the application and how you're using it. Um, the crushing force on this is not being affected by these two holes right here. Uh, it's all triangulated and squared. So these two right here are gonna be plenty strong for the chassis. They're gonna be super strong for our sway bar. And we're not gonna get any negative attributes from it. I hope this is okay with you guys. Um, I'm not claiming to be the expert on go-kart building. I'm just showing you how I built mine. And I have one that's worked out really well so far. Um, I've got a second one that's almost done. This is the third, so I'm applying a lot of what I've learned uh, through doing this. All right, so now we're gonna move our attention out to the A-arm, or A-arms. We're gonna put in this cross member for this to hook onto. Um, I'm gonna leave it long so I have a good place to, to square it up. 
Um, looks like we're just gonna nibble off the edges with the hole saw. Now for your notches, uh, here is a very inexpensive but invaluable tool. I use it a lot, especially when I'm doing a 90 degree cross member. So you can just line this up with your bar. You can set this parallel and then you can get your gauge reading from that. Looks like we are at 35 degrees. You can also look at your plans and whatever bend this is, whatever notch this is, is gonna be the same. So let's get it notched up, get it in place. Now we're just gonna make some taps with a straight bottom that's gonna go right on top of this cross member. So this is sometimes the issue with uh, used ATV parts. Um, this won't come off and I'm going to damage it if I try to get it off. But the good thing about used ATV parts is that you can just order another rod in. There, that wasn't too bad, but it's still gonna need replaced. Just the fact we got it off without damaging the shaft. Now you can build your own, you can get some just female internally threaded, get some rod to match it, uh, tap or dye it, and then you've got yourself a very, very nice set of uh, sway bar end links. These are only about 11 bucks each. So, but we'll fit it up with the stock ones. And uh, if we do go this route, we'll just match the rod lengths and thread and everything. All right, from here, you wanna put your sway bar level. You wanna put your end link, heim joint, whatever you wanna call it, against there. Mark it at the intersection. And double check it. Since it was slipping around, you take it off. All right, so this mark is the reference for the end link spot not where we're gonna cut it. So you can see the internal threads of this, we're gonna make this this long, and all of this is going to be threaded. Now you're gonna to wanna to do them at the same time because your end link should be the same length. All right, it's time for the tap and die set. Uh, if you don't have one, don't worry, uh, you can get one at Harbor Freight on the super cheap. All right, looks like this is an M10 size bolt. Get it on there and do a, a nice die job. Looks like it's actually a 1.25 thread, but I am using a 1.5 thread because the rod ends on this doesn't matter. They're uh, a crimped style. So actually cross threading them will help them stay on a little better. I ran these on my black one for, I don't know, 80 to 100 hours of riding. Haven't lost one yet. So, pretty good, pretty good system. All right, let's put her in, see how she looks. There's one. And there's two. Now you notice this has a slight angle to it. I do that because the track width of a four wheeler is 45 to 50 inches and the track width of ours is around 60 inches. So if I could steal an inch or two to get uh, a little more action out of this sway bar, I'm definitely gonna do that. And that's it, I'm gonna uh, button up the other side. Uh, make sure to finish your welding. Uh, you'll see the end product of this once I get the hardware in. And we're getting very close to final welding of the chassis. I actually might do that next. A anti-sway bar from a four-wheeler onto your cross cart. Total cost, 15 bucks. If you have to replace the end links, maybe 50 bucks. Still, uh, I did look at aftermarket ones uh, because they're adjustable and they look cool. <laughs> but you're looking at 500 bucks, 300 bucks. Uh, for me, I wanted to keep the cost down. So I tried to come up with clever ways like repurposing a utility quads sway bar onto our buggy. 
Now there is something I want to point out from the driver fit up. In the final scene, uh, my legs looked kind of cramped. Uh, they weren't, it was comfortable, I wasn't lying about it. But I did have the seat bottoms in the wrong hole. I had them all the way forward. So there is two, two, maybe two and a half, three inches more leg room than what that video showed. Uh, I know that doesn't seem like a lot, but you think of an inseam of, you know, 33 versus 35, that's a significantly taller person. Um, we also have some more adjustment on the pedals. I might cut those tabs loose and get that extra one inch just to see how much I can maximize the space in here. Uh, since I used two U-joints, it really opened up that front end to make more adjustment for the pedals. But I haven't decided yet. Um, I know you guys are in a hurry to see this running and out doing donuts and stuff, but uh, I take my time on these and make sure everything is, is perfect because once this is all welded together, painted up, final assembly, it would be so much work to try to redo something. Uh, so I try to do it up front. Uh, with the black one, my first one, uh, I got it all finished and then after I drove it, I realized there were some things I needed to change on it. Uh, so I had to grind away the paint, I had to refab things, re-weld it to get it figured out. Uh, I, I learned from that. I mean, that's why I did that one all the way to completion before I started a second buggy. Um, I needed to learn everything about building these before I built a second one. And then before I offered it to you, I was going to build that buggy from my plans, or at least the chassis, to make sure every component worked on it before I went through this build with you. Uh, it just gives you an idea of how I don't rush through things. Uh, New York winters can be kind of long. <laughs> So, uh, I'm not crazy about driving these in the snow. Uh, I was considering studying some tires and heading up and doing some ice racing. But as, as far as this goes, even, even though I have all winter to do it, uh, I'm still gonna take my time and make sure everything's done correctly. That's just my way of doing things. And the more information I can pass along to you for your builds, uh, the better I'll feel about <laughs> taking the extra time to film it and a lot of extra time to edit it. This would actually probably almost be done if I didn't have to do all the filming and editing. But it's been a really good time. Uh, I appreciate all the comments and kind words. Um, it's been really fun sharing this with you and I can't wait till we get it running together. Thanks for watching.